Hey, trustees, we are live. We are recording. Phone lines are open. You are good to go. Welcome, everybody, to the meeting of the Hampton Town Trustees on June 13th. 2022. Um, Arlene, can you do Scott O'Briner. I work at InterScience Research Associates. My official title is Senior Environmental Planner and Landscape Architect. I won't make this overly complicated, everyone. Um, the trustees issued this permit for a Phragmites cutting and a wetland restoration about a year ago. Um, it expires August 8th, just um, about a month and a half from now. Trustees, excuse me one second. Can we uh, move that uh, poster maybe to the left? Because I'm not getting his the, the podium uh, video, really. Move it to the left. Perfect. There we go. All right. Thank you. So um, the trustees issued this permit uh, uh, about a year ago. It will expire August 8th. Um, we are not proposing any modifications. We're simply asking for a renewal to allow the contractor to complete the job. The job has been initiated. And uh, what I will do, the contractor is actually here. The contractor is Grimes Land Design. So what I would like to do is ask Jim Grimes to come up to the podium, not as a trustee, but as the contractor, and explain to you guys what needs to be done. What needs to be left over? All right. Before I do go up there, I want to recuse myself to the fact that I am involved in this project. And by the way, I am here with Eric Brown, the attorney for this project of uh, Ackerman Partners. Thanks, Jim. Uh, hey, folks. Some of you may know me. I sit next to you. Anyway, this is a project that was designed, I think, roughly three years ago. Um, the house was just completed here this past spring. We started this project last December with the cutting of the Phragmites, stripping of the root mat and the weeds that are, were on the property. Presently, the, we're in the phase of basically invasive weed control. Okay, so the initial Phragmites cutting along the shore has been done. The non-native grasses in that which comprised the buffer have been cut, stripped, stockpiled on site. We're in the process right now of composting that material on site and tilling and controlling whatever weed seeds are germinating on the site. And that'll occur until such time as that we're satisfied that we have somewhat exhausted the seed bank in the upland portions. We will continue to cut the shoreline Phragmites as it emerges. And in terms of planting, the timing of this project was initially proposed for June of 2022. But given the way the season has progressed, the cooler temperatures, the amount of weed seeds that are developing, I do not expect to plant this project probably until 
I want to say the earliest, mid-July, more likely mid-August. Um, there is no changes in terms of what was proposed. There are no changes made as far as what's in the plan. Everything will go in there exactly as it was proposed. Um, and I think Eric has, has pretty much outlined that. So if anybody has any questions on what's going on there, I'd be happy to answer. Well, here's the thing. Like I said, we will not do the planting until such time as, as we're satisfied that the, um, the invasives are well under control. And that's the kiss of death to these projects. We've reviewed many projects before this board where the preparatory work was cut short, whether it was due to the fact that the, um, that the permit was running out, whether it was due to the fact of impatience on the part of builder, contractor, or owner. But the worst thing you can do on any of these um, revegetation re projects is try and push a time envelope because we're working with nature. So, John, to your point, um, I, as I said, I expect the planting to perhaps occur mid-July, mid-August, but there will be other things going on on this property for the next basically several years. We've got a five-year cu uh, cutting permit with the DEC. Uh, we'll be coming back to this board, or I should say InterScience will be coming back to this board on an annual basis to re renew permits for the purposes of management and maintenance on this project. Why don't we just renew it for a year and a half? Okay. I can't say that, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what, would you like? what, what are the benefits uh, in, in the project that you're doing, eliminating the, uh, these non-native species well, and replanting? Uh, eliminating, you know, what this, pro what this property was prior to this, it was a vacant lot, okay? It was a lot that was comprised of what could be described as a pasture mix, which was mostly non-native grasses. You know, they were mostly European grasses. Now, what we had a significant amount of on this property are two things, mile a minute and mugwort. Okay, both are non-native plants. One is an annual mile a minute. The other mugwort is a perennial in the chrysanthemum family. Okay, once we have done planting, there's virtually no way to go in there and selectively address those problems. So the smart move here is when you've got basically a co totally clear slate is to continue to bang away at these things until such point as you feel confident that, that the, the populations are beyond the point where they're gonna, where they're gonna naturally recover. Even under the best circumstances, it is not going to be a complete and hundred percent control of the non-native invasives. We will be ha we will have to monitor this, and we will have to basically perform some annual tasks. One of which is cutting back the herbaceous plants in this in this meadow, because unattended, just left to run on their own, what will ultimately happen is the aerial will will sort of naturally begin to secede to some non-native vegetation. And the outcome of the non-native vegetation, does that have a detrimental impact on the water quality? And it does, you know, I, I don't think you can really quantify that in, in its impacts on the water quality. I think the impacts on the water quality really come down to a homeowner that feels that their revegetation project has failed and wants to go back to my lawn down to the water's edge, complete with irrigation. And uh, when you do these things right, you end up with something that functions in the environment, provides habitats, a food source for wildlife, provides the filtration of any surface runoff, keeps the irrigation out of there, keeps the fertilizers and stuff, which, which have be, been proven to be problematic to these water bodies. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. Almost, I think it's 100 feet, isn't it? What, what the that? depth of the buffer? buffer? Because there's two, there's two parts to this buffer, John. Um, one... 
150 feet. Shrubs and grasses. Now, now, the plant agreed to 150 foot well and buffer of natural plantings. This is all really good. Yeah. It is, because remember, guys, typically, this is in the village. Typically, in the village, we're getting a 30 foot buffer. Okay, this is 150 feet, and it was done in two components. The first component, which was the upland portion, which we did not design, the other portion of the, of the, uh, of the buffer was the shoreline area, which actually projects into our pond bottom. Okay, so. Thank you, John. What are you asking for? Well, basically, we're, what, what Scott was asking for is a, re, a one year renewal on the permit. Yeah, same exact permit, just renewed one more year. And, and just keep in mind, he's not telling you. They're going to be back here in a year for renewal on these. And, and with the goal, honestly, of the trustees and the village being able to monitor these, these, these reveg projects, basically for not only for performance, but compliance at the end of the day. Because one of the big issues with, with any of these restoration projects is, is in the long term, compliance. You know, if you've if you've got a uh, if the property changes hands or something happens where somebody doesn't see the vision and somebody wants to basically chip away at this and try and put it back to what it was, I don't think any of this you know it doesn't serve the community in any way, shape, or form. So, can we propose a two-year permit since you know they're going to be? Uh, I think I think I think the applicant is very comfortable with coming back here on an annual basis because, and I can't tell you what to do. Uh, what the village has asked for is annual monitoring and reporting. Uh, that's, that's. Do you want to make a motion to? Um, I'll make a motion to go one year extension. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Board of Trustees. You just voted to approve for one year, right? Yeah. Okay. It's got awesome. an easy permit. Thank you so much. Four years left. We'll probably be back a year from now, but um, that's also up to the client as to who the client chooses to go with. Yeah. But, um, we like visiting with you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, pardon me? The DC permit, that's, that was five years before that. Is that correct? I didn't hear you. The DEC permit. The DEC permit will actually expire. I got, I got it right here. The DEC permit expires in 25, 7, 25, 25. Okay. The ZBA does not expire. So um, while we're still working to complete the job, we'll definitely keep all the permits up. Um, then when we get into the monitoring stage, We'll see what we need to have renewed on a regular basis. You know, maybe maybe I, we will be going to appear to you on a yearly basis. I, I don't know. I would think um, maintenance would require these. I would like to think that this project would be successful maybe three or four years from now, and we don't have to appear before you maintenance anymore. Great, right? You know. <laughs> So you find a way to, and you guys have a mile a minute away forever. You could also renew the DEC permit. Say that again, please. No, I mean you could also renew the DEC permit. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, is yeah. that required for maintenance anyway? No, it's just DEC town trustees on the East Hampton Village ZBA for maintenance. <coughs> right, that's what I mean. Five-year permit. I know, but once that expires and maintenance goes on, you still need a DEC yes. permit. That was my mm -hmm. question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you. <coughs> All right. And uh, again, we have Empty Science, C1 LLC, and Don 2 LLC. Don 2 Close. Let's do more for trying to present that one, I guess. Thank you. Pass them out. One for the esteemed attorney. Oh, thank you, sir. Thanks for working. Yeah.
Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a different approach uh, from Scott. You already saw what Scott had to uh, say. Um, this is an exciting project. This is the old Tiedemann uh, property. Uh, it's two lots at the end of uh, the road. It's a big, wide expanse of shoreline. And we've had enough success removing the uh, common reed and the other invasives that uh, there's a fair amount of planting that's been done. So what you have is some pictures. Now, this is a draft report that I put together for Billy Hayjack at the village. It's a draft report, but it includes all of the monitoring report for last uh, growing season, and it includes photos from this from late this spring when the uh, phragmite starts to show, and it includes the surveys, and it includes the uh, uh, proposed and approved landscape plan that was drawn up by James C. Grimes Land Design. So I have Jim sitting behind me as well. Um, and what we're asking for, again, is identical to Scott and Eric Brown. Um, we need to come to the trustees each year and ask for a renewal. Arlene sent me an email. She said I could appear now or a couple weeks from now. And since we were doing the work for the village uh, monitoring requirement anyway, I told Arlene that I'd come see her. Um, that's basically it. The, this project is a little farther along than some of them because there's a fair amount of planting that's been done. There's some shoreline stabilization in terms of biologues. And if you want to talk to precise technical uh, issues, uh, I would suggest you ask uh, Jim. When is this permit up? To tell you the truth, we have so much work that I really haven't had a chance to look at when the trustees, maybe Arlene could tell us. I, I'm, not, I'm not certain. Um, we need a one-year renewal, and I need it also to provide to the village the monitoring report. So it's kind of a, a hybrid uh, request into the trustees for renewal at the same time into the village for uh, to document the monitoring that I was required to do. Well, you know when this permit expires? Um, unfortunately, I can just check that. Um, we could email Arlene tomorrow. Um, or she can tell you. Um, again, we need, we need a annual renewal, same as the last project that you heard each year. We need to come back to the uh, trustees. At the same time with this project, I'm going to be going back to Billy Hayjack at the village and documenting the progress that's been made. Yeah, uh, this is pretty standard. We, we like to look at them every year just to keep Looks beautiful. In progress. Uh, Jim can take all the credit for that. Yeah, Ben and I walked in with Jim. Yeah, we did. And uh, it was really impressive and looked really healthy. Um, you can see in these photos, they're, the plants that are in there are nice and big, and they look healthy. And yeah, uh, yeah, it was, it was. I, I don't know. I don't know too much about this, but it's really well done. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we started this project about 15 years ago for Carl T. And then, uh, Jim could correct me if I'm wrong. We never really made it work until more recently. And uh, the more recent uh, permutation of this plant is spectacular. This is something special. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would urge you to go down, park at the end, and walk, walk over to the construction trailer and just take a look. If someone asks you what you're doing there, let them know. But uh, they never bother me when I go there. I like, I like to go there and see all the native plants growing. Yes, it's really impressive what's, what's going on there and the way they started the plant from seed and, and nurtured them. It's, it's pretty good. Cool. really good examples. Yeah. I saw it in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty small. spectacular. Yeah, so they're a great plant in place that's going to be tough to fail, which is important. So I don't see any reason not to do this. Um, the, this, this project was reviewed by the DEC, was re reviewed by the trustees was reviewed by the village and it took a long time to get it off the ground and uh, it's coming out nice. So I think that's a credit to uh, everybody involved, especially the 
designer and contractor. Are you guys done planting there? No okay. You're going to have to ask Jim. Yeah. Jim, you want to talk about it a little bit? Sure. Um, Jim Grimes, contractor on the job. Anyway, uh, there is some, you know, there's going to be some ongoing planting there. There's, there's some planting left along the immediate shoreline where we're still working on some Phragmites, which will likely occur. It's going to be occurring midsummer. But then there is some subsequent planting that we're proposing for what are really two sort of pond areas uh, that we recognize what will work in there and what really doesn't. So we're going to be making some modifications or really additions on that. Um, but, you know, this is one of those projects that we started it was the winter of last year, so it was the winter of, of like 2021. We came in, we cut the Phragmites, and this is a seven-acre project. Okay, this is not a small thing at, at all. We cut the Phragmites, we stockpiled the cuttings, we successfully composted that material. We co can removed all of the inorganic material old tires, cement blocks, railroad ties, and stuff that over the years had basically been deposited in a couple of the ponds there. And um, we spent all of last summer getting this to a state where it was ready for planting. Um, it was, I think, the second week of September we started planting it. Or the last week of September, we completed all the plantings. Is roughly eighty thousand plugs and a few hundred more shrubs and stuff in here. It was a pretty robust planting. Everything was custom grown for the site in a larger size, and it's really paid off because we've been able to, in one season, have the look of something that typically would take three seasons to have the same sort of character about it. Um, our incidence of, of non-native invasives is fairly low. We still have a mop, you know, we're still working on Phragmites, um, but that was something that was very much expected. Mile a minute, which was rampant through this site, um, has really been reduced to just culling out a few plants. You know, we're going through this property every three weeks and uh, hand pulling the front, the, the mile a minute. It's an annual. As long as you get on it before it's flowered and gone to seed, you've eliminated that plant. Um, we still have some small pockets of, of, um, of mugwort on this property, but we, we have them very much under control because when we came in here, we basically had seven acres of mile a minute mugwort and phragmites. And uh, now we have something a little better. But this is another one of those projects that will be probably coming back every year for, for a good while. It's nice to see the uh, it's nice to see the community of uh, of the town doing things like this. Well, it's I'll tell you what. What's really nice is to see those two ponds, which were completely engulfed with Phragmites, where they're productive. You've got puddle duck moving into those ponds all through the season. When there's water, when there's water impounded in those things, there's ducks in the pond. We've had uh, when those ponds have gotten overwashed, which does happen during some storms. When the pond is let, we've had bunker and stuff in those ponds. We've had the the ospreys pecking the bunker out of the pond out of the ponds. It's pretty it's pretty nice to watch. You know, I was standing there. When was it? A few weeks ago. Was it with you, Jim? That there was we counted twenty three ospreys. Work in work in the pond in one spot that day. That's a beautiful picture. No, they were all they were all at the South Bottleneck in George Cove. I mean, it was I've never seen I've never seen uh, osprey where basically they were acting like seagulls. Anyway, anybody got any questions? I think we should make another motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion. Uh, Second. Montfair. Aye. 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 Well, thanks, guys. Okay. Just make a note that uh, Jim was recused from this one as well. I'm not sure yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for coming.
Okay, next we have two English. Good evening and thank you for listening to me. Can you announce your response? Good evening, thank you. My name is Susie Lish. I'm going to take my mask off. Pardon? Twist your microphone down. Okay. I'm going to touch it. I'm sorry. I have a 90 year old mother, so I have to be very careful with what's going on. Anyway, thank you for taking time to listen to me. I'm here because about 10 years ago, I started to notice a lot of cars parking on Maidstone Beach 3, which is my backyard. So I've been there 30 years and I'm familiar with the beach. Um, and it's been getting increasingly more crazy there. And I don't go there anymore. I just drive by and cringe. And I finally got to a point where I made some inquiries about five years ago that the trustees had grandfathered in vehicular parking on that small section only. And the, it's the, I call it the Blue Lagoon or the Baby Beach, which is Maidstone Park road when you come around the bend there's a teeny little sandbar where the boats come in and out and it's become kind of a parking lot everyone's driving on this very small very fragile area of the beach and well i live at hotter avenue so my water view across i can see it from hotter which is a dead end inlet where all the ospreys are also I had, it's amazing. It's a migratory path there. And again, 30 years I've been, I've been there. So I've watched it. Such a beautiful, beautiful place. Yes. Ecosystem, fragile, everything. Seasonally, it's beautiful. But the cars that are parking on this little sandbar now are wearing out the beach. And I've noticed a serious change where the beach looks thin and worn out and kind of dirty and the car, you know, the, the um, tire, the wear and tear of the beach is really starting to disturb me. Where do you think that so, that sand went to? It's being pushed back in. And then, you know, I understand it's a evolution of they drive on the beach and then it's washed up and it's cleared, but it's not... That's not what's happening there. It's really worn out and the shape has changed drastically. That may be environmental, but there's no question to me that the human footprint is making a huge impact on that small beach. And something bad's going to happen with a pedestrian and the cars, children swimming, elderly people. It just, it's a bad situation. I'm just here to ask the trustees to explain to me the protocol to review the original law and to just look at it, to go back and see when the family sold the property for $1 to East Hampton saying, we want this to be a public park for perpetuity. And if it changes, we're going to return it to the family heirs. It's a, uh, I wrote in my email, the name of the family. Okay. So, so that so, portion of the beach is what runs along the bay. It's not the home, the stretch. You turn the corner after the pavilion. Say, I'm, I'm explaining to you yes. the portion of the people, the portion that was left in the town is the portion that runs along the beach. Yes, and the, and the pavilion. Down inside was not, that was not part of the property. The beach that's, you're speaking about is not. So that's not, that's not that's part of it? That's not part of it? Oh, very good. It was the dread spoil site. It, it, it was created by dredge spoil. It's not a beach. Yeah. That's what you're looking at. What it's you're not what you're a beach, but it's what you're describing as this fragile, yeah, pristine it's, it's man piece of nature is totally man-made. It was it was based, it was made how part of the effluent from dredging three mile harbor. Now more than some, thirty years ago. And, yeah. Yes. Because I've been point, there for thirty years. Okay, maybe you were shopping that day. No, they they summer, burned right? the fire, they burned that fishing building down. Okay, that's not, that beach <laughs> that you're describing is baby beach. The beach did not exist okay. 30 years ago. Okay, I don't think it was 30, I think it's less than 30 years ago that that I've beach was there. done. And it was done when Three Mile Harbor was dredged, okay? 
all of that material was was basically pumped up there. Now, after that material was pumped up there, they blamed that off of the bulldozer. And if you notice, when you walk on that beach, it does not have anything close to the character of any of the other beaches around here because the particle size on that beach is more closer to what you could describe as moral. Okay, which is why. Well, I've been swimming there could, for 30 years and it's drive, very lovely. You could drive a two wheel drive car on that beach, probably. Yeah. Nice and, dark, and they That's have. Enough, right? It's so hard. But the trustees giving you a little history mm -hmm. when that was decided, whatever, I forget what they right. labeled it or called it, but that was basically put aside for vehicle access. And the purpose behind that originally was you have elderly people, people that don't get around that much that want to go fishing, okay? That would, that the process of parking at the parking lot across the road. Which is five, five feet from the sand, okay. literally. Okay. 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 It's a bit of a walk to get over there. No. So they made that vehicle access. When they did it, I totally babies, I don't think entered into the equation, but you know what? It's fairly warm water. That little cold is protected. A lot of mothers like to go down in with their four-wheel drives, basically tailgate off the back of the beach. And you know what? It may be offensive, perhaps, to you, but, man, what I would like to point out is it's part of being good neighbors, okay? Yeah. These are families, a lot of people that, that use that beach down there for their kids that are parking down there are full-time residents of this community for as long and probably a lot of them longer man, than you have. You know, the thing about a community I, is... I, I'm going gonna, gonna to interrupt you, sir. Please, you have to let me interrupt you. Okay, so I'm a Conklin, okay. the person I live with, I'm a Conklin who settled down again. Okay. Now, I have lived in the house across the street from Michael's restaurant for 15 years before they tore it down. And then I moved up the block. I have been there for 30 years watching that beach. I understand what you're saying about families and being a good neighbor. I understand about children. It's a dangerous situation over there. And it is affecting the migratory path. It is affecting all the animals, the crabs, whatever is there. It is an e a very sensitive ecosystem, regardless if the town dumped dirt on that area. That still doesn't remove its fragile value to us as a, a, a recreational area for people to enjoy. It has become a parking lot. Much like Coney Island or the Jersey Shore, no offense to New Jersey. You're talking about a really small it's very park. unpleasant, very and large. a lot of people are upset. I have put it on the board, the East Hampton board. I've been getting hun a hundred responses a day how horrified people are that when they go to the beach, it looks like a parking lot. It's no longer what you're saying, this lovely tailgating, like a uh, couple cars. It's not. And I'm going to start taking pictures every day. It, it's depressing. It's it's depressing and unnerving. But you know, I don't go there anymore. I just haven't gone in five years. I don't. I don't. I, go, I pay for a sticker at Georgica because there I can. I don't have to look at cars on the beach. We have enough cars on the road. I would assume people don't want to go to the beach and see a car on the beach because. All we do is see cars. It's only a small area, man. And you know, when it is a small area. area. It's very important to the neighborhood. Bridge, again, which is inevitable. It's become that, a very that high site, traffic area. That, that site will probably change yet again because they're going to put that sand somewhere. And it, that is, that's an area that really is designated for the purpose of that. You know, we've, we've got a navigable waterway nearby. Uh, when you dredge those those waterways out, okay, that so, sand has got to go somewhere. What about Sammy's Beach and all the other inlets? I don't understand why this well, actually, one that place... was one of the sad things. Sammy's Beach originally was a dredge spoil. No, they, the, the last, you know, this thing has a long history. Yes, no, I'm Sam, very Sam's aware of it. Beach is where the, the, the spoil, you know, last time. This is one small area adjacent. 
to a huge area of beach yeah. that no vehicles are allowed. But that is difficult access for elderly and children. Now that is 60, this, 70 you know, feet. This is like almost a, a conflict of views and groups. It, the people you're talking the about is set up. It's very nice for a person who has small children and all the paraphernalia that comes with it. Oh and I okay, you don't think that's just laziness? Because in the no. history of our station wagons that have now turned into SUVs and huge vehicles, when people had station wagons, I mean, Mrs. Conklin, she would take a carriage up to like. Hedges Bank when they were having, you know, epidemics. I, I, I've heard all the stories. People had carriages and horses. These they were they were not meant for cars. I understand the the fishermen had to back up at one point for their livelihoods. But this is a whole other thing now. People are bringing like their machinery and their blenders and their microwaves and they're setting up camp and they're ruining the beach. So I, I guess I, we we have a different mindset. I think something awful is going to happen. Someone's going to get injured there. It's way out of control. Well, and I, I need, just, I'm just requesting with all due respect that you review the insanity that's going on there now. It's not just nice like people going and having a little tailgate party. It's really out of control. I, and that's how I feel. I, I think you have you know, a reasonable point of view. Yeah, it, it's disturbing. Of, we hear different points of view. Right. About that beach from different sides. I just like to say that a couple of years ago, you know, we did make an attempt to do some traffic control there okay. to separate we'll limit how many cars from where the cars drove. And we'll continue to look at it. Because there is a square footage allowance. I've looked at the state of New York, I've looked at the laws, and a certain percentage of square footage versus a certain percentage of cars there is a, a ratio and it's that's what i'm asking maybe they have to limit it or or make a safe way but it, it's dreadful and I, i'm sorry that uh this is where we have the conversation it's a, so you, so i'm going to leave feeling now that this is not really a beach that has an ecosystem it's a dredging area which is something, it's a dredging area, right? It's not, well, I it's think not. The point is the, the beach. It's not um, talking, valued. The beach itself mm -hmm. that you're talking about is dredge spoil. That, and it's a fact. I'm not, I'm not saying, I, I don't think anybody's saying that. And that, generally speaking. So cars are, should be able to drive on it. That's, no, okay, no, I understand. No, 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 no. Don't, don't say, don't. No, but it, it seems that. like that's how we're, we're. Well, I didn't say that. No, I know. I'm just saying the material on there is dredged. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that the ecosystem around it right. isn't a sensitive ecosystem. It is. Just the birds there. Are, and it's changing. It's really changing. But. What about all the chemicals from the cars that are dripping down on that? It's like, it's grotesque. They just have the cars on, they leave them on and all these electric things and things drip out of the cars and the tailpipe. It's so horrible. I don't understand. The, the, the cement is like literally five feet from the beach. But, all right, thank you very much for li listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I'll never go to that beach again. And, and I am, you know, I'm going to die in that house and I'm going to watch this happen. It's very sad. All right. Well, thank you very much. I just wish you would do it. So I'm going to get hurt. I'd like to address the boards. I'm just going to get hurt. Thank you. Should I speak from here? Uh, uh, okay. the, and uh, let us know your name. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Pettigrew. Well, first of all, I want to say this is my first time here, and I want to say thank you for your work because I, I, I do see the value of preserving the place where we live. And I think the, all of you, the work you do is, is pretty amazing. So I had no concept of it. So it's kind of nice. Um, I'm here because um, <clears throat> I'm building um, a house of Three Mile Harbor just behind the boatyard. I don't know, um, Arlene, if you give. Uh, any information or papers, or did, do we have any like? I can send around an email. I can send another one. Um, the I'm sorry, the I, I, I don't. Probably uh, describe it better. We own a piece of boatyard land that goes to three marinas. Um, 
the Three Mile Harbor Band of Beers at East End New Marina. And we own a tiny road where, John, I believe that's where you cut down some trees. Now you know where I'm going. Yeah. Exactly where we have the tree coming over. There's three houses there. Private road, number five private road. Um, that road, that that road itself is a trustee road, is that yes. what so, that private road? No, we own a piece of land. Behind. Yes, private, uh, both yard road is a trustee road. Right. And we own a piece of land behind it. Um, I can forward the email. I thought I sent it, um, I don't recall. To a few people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I just, the, the, road, the private road off Boatyard Lane. Is all by us. But he, the lot behind. Let me pull up the next step. Well, maybe what would be helpful. <laughs> what do you need? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's better. So, yeah. So basically, it's a very small little piece of land that I acquired four years ago. Sorry. And then we started construction about a year ago. And we're almost done. And, um, the land that is behind between Three Mile Harbor and my property is owned by you guys. And um, I'm very pleased with that <laughs> because you know, it's like, it's gonna yeah. stay the way it is. <laughs> um, the, what I'm asking today is the lot is very small. No, I have everything here. The house is also very small and the um, gas, the petrol, I mean, uh, propane, uh, petrol company, um, you know, it's, it's just like the, the, you know, it's going to be 10 feet from the neighbors and do a strong, strong number five. And then, you know, I'm asking basically if it's possible. I have the survey, I can pass around. Put the, the proper tank on the limit, not within 10 feet, like, like on the limit okay. of the. So you're I can try for, to put it up. For, this house is here by this corner. We own the lot behind the, the it. Property line, mm -hmm. I think you need 10 feet per. per yes, they wanted yes. 10 feet. Mm -hmm. He's asking. Thank you. And you can't get 10 feet on your own property? I could, but then the tank will be sitting in front of my kind of front door. So it's it's just kind of a. Are you going for a very tank? You can't. No. You're too close. The only way you can do is strap it in the. You put it on a slant, but I think you're still too close to groundwater. Even yeah, the groundwater is about four feet below. Yeah. yeah. Um, now we looked at these options. On your property? Is this going to be on the corner of your property? No, he's asking to put it on our property. Uh, is that what he's But I mean, not on your property, but but I'm asking for the 10 feet. Uh, more than 10 feet. Well, right. on the line. You want permission to keep it on your property totally. within 10 feet of our property. Correct. Okay. Hold on. Let's back up. We're not the guy that makes this decision. Regardless of who the neighboring property owner is, the East Hampton town and the zoning department, the zoning department, will need to issue a variance so that he can place a propane tank less than 10 feet from the property line. So it almost is irrelevant that we're the property neighbor. Other than that, they're going to have to notice us prior to the hearing and we'll have the opportunity to be heard. But what I'm getting at, Eric, is you're going to need to get a variance from the town of East Hampton. Okay. Um, and they're going to ask for the trustees to weigh in. So this is a nice starting point so the trustees can begin to understand what you're asking. But ultimately, you're going to need to visit the uh, planning board and the zoning mm -hmm. department. Uh, you the mean the CBA? Yeah. 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 You have a natural resources special permit. Correct. Yeah. And when they did that, it had specific language conditions in it. Okay. In addition to that, is the basic rules, building building rules for the town, the building rules that the state parts on. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to be asking for is some relief in that. Now, for us as your adjacent neighbor, mm -hmm. we can, when you apply for that variance, we're going to get noticed, just like all your other neighbors, and we can go to that hearing or write a letter in and contest you put in your gas tank closer to your property line. Mm -hmm. But I think, personally, mm -hmm. I think this would be one that not only would maybe we not contest it, mm -hmm. that perhaps this is sort of a common sense variance that nobody's going to be offended mm -hmm. by this gas tank. No other property is going to be threatened by this gas tank. 
closer to the line. And what this is all about is it's a health and safety deal. Mm -hmm. They don't want you planting a gas tank on your property line when perhaps your neighbor's house might be a pre-existing non-conforming situation only six feet away and if something happens. You know, in this case here, I'm looking at it. There's nothing going to be threatened mm -hmm. by your gas tank. And I think this is something that we could probably either support or at the very least not mm -hmm. contest. Yeah, I just did. I, I guess I don't have much experience with all this, and I just want to do the proper way. No, can I tell you, you made a good yeah. move here. Thanks. You did. You just came to the neighbor, you knocked on our door, and said, Would you, would mm -hmm. you have a problem with me putting my gas tank here? And we said, Well, we haven't. I said, I wouldn't have a big problem, mm -hmm. but you still have to. You have to still have to get this. The the CBL the Cross approval. The keys, dot yeah. the eyes. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen? Okay. When you're going to get your CLs, you're not getting a CL. Mm -hmm. so, and what I might suggest mm -hmm. is look at the gas tank next to your front door for a while so you can get your CL and then move it and down. then apply for that variant so that you can live in your house. While you're pursuing, yeah, because the process was very long just to get yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, just the other variants. Yes, yeah, so you, know the, you. Drill. you yeah. know the drill. The fact of the matter is, what do you have? 150 pound gas tank. It's not, you don't have a 500 gallon gas tank above ground. No, it's going to be like the, I forgot the name, like 240 maybe. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's above ground to stand on a tank. The gas company can come down at any point. And we tank this wall, pick it up, and move it wherever you want. Okay. I'm very pleased that I, I come here today because the 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 person, the, the gas company or the pet petrol, I mean uh, propane, mm -hmm. yeah. petrol something, I forgot the name. Um the his name was Chuck. And he said he's like, I've been doing it for 30 years, it's okay to put the the, the tank on the line, you know, on your side of the property, but, yeah. you know, no, it's not. I know, that's why I was like, that's why I was like, wait a minute, like, uh, should I just check that out first? No. Okay. Eric, how did he put the tank in? Is it there? No, 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 no. We're planning to do it on the 24th of June. Right. So, ben has I know, stories. in 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably not the best idea. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. speak to your attorney about whether or not that's a good idea, but that's going to end up being something that's going to violate the town code mm -hmm. if you do put it in in that location. And guys, with the survey I just saw with John shows that you know kind of on the property line, on our property, some clearing onto our property. So we can hypothesize about this and opine about it as much as we want. But ultimately, we're going to want to take a look at the plans and the survey and this application for the uh, for a variance. So I think you're going to need a variance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I'll go a gym, right? Yeah. yeah. I think I'll go with your idea of, uh, of, of just putting it in my area. Because it's more, you know, for all intents and purposes, okay. you know, alert the gas company your intention and probably leave some extra pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, or it's not going to be that big a deal to extend the pipe over to where, to where you need it later on. Right. So right. This way, this way, you're not basically stuck. Whether there's financing attached to your house or something, the final payments would be held up because you don't have a CO. No, of course. Get the get the CO okay. and then apply and then apply for okay. the variances. I'll just put nice greenery and native plants around this. Yeah. <laughs> and you might want to use an attorney to help with the variance. Yes, I have a yeah. I have. I'm working with uh, Rick Wanna. Yeah. yeah. Eric, can you, yeah, he's our <laughs> former trustee attorney. Um, can you spell your last name for us? Sure, of course. P E T T I G R E W. Pettigrew. Oh, Pettigrew. Okay. Yeah. Very good. For minutes. No, after minutes, yeah. Where's your family from? Um, I am from Quebec. I've been in the area for 12 years. Families yeah. yeah. from America. Pettigrew. Pettigrew. It's fast. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. From the French side or the Spanish? Yeah. Port Royal, I mean, part of the first French settlement in the New World. Mm. I know there's some pedigree in the Saga Harbor. I yeah. Heard, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I never met them. Yeah. 
You guys are cousins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is your, what is your last name? Hey. No, no. So the Quebecis and the Montreal people man, they don't want to speak the same language. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like slang, that's for sure, in that Quebec language. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for your time. What was your last name, Jim? My last name is Grimes, but my, my oh, grandma's name is Helpful. Okay. Yeah. And, and you really, like, you really think all, that it comes No, no, all families, several, like, Montauk, uh -huh. all came from Cape Breton area. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. So cool. spoke, we still spoke French in the stores and stuff back in the 50s and 60s. Wow, that's brand new, <laughs> that's brand new news to me. Wow. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> thank you for coming. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me and listening we'll to me you and your again. advice as well. Yeah, appreciate Agreed. it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You say bon nuit? Bon nuit? No, on, we say bonsoir. Bonsoir. Yeah, bon nuit is like a night. Like a oh, yeah. Yeah. Bon, yeah. bon nuit is a laundry yeah. store. Yeah, they can talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, under new business. Okay, it was working. So, we've recently had some inquiries about um, fish traps in Fremont Harbor. So, we thought maybe John would like to. Um, are we doing uh, Hold on for that. No, no, John, I just want to give us a little history on this just and it would how and why they are where they are. Okay, great. It'd be useful for the board to sort of try to understand fish traps in the harbors. We, I don't think, from the time I've been on the board, I don't think we've had any reason to no. uh, look at them. Basically, so the, 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 the location is chosen by the fishermen and the fish, right? Yeah, you have that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, there's a fish trap now over on the west side of Three Mile Harbor, and uh, it's is it showing up? It's a traditional site. Uh, it was fished 30 years ago, maybe more than 30 years ago, last I believe, mm -hmm. by uh, by a fisherman who who has traps. Uh, in Northwest Harbor, and I believe maybe in Hedges Banks as well. Hasn't fished that, that site for a while, but there's an, another commercial fisherman now that's taken over his site. Come on. And uh, this is it. Uh, this, is the, this is the location of the trap. This is the access, the public access uh, at the end of Duke Drive. There's a path, uh, there's a curve in the road here, and there's a walking path down to the water there. That's public access. And the reason this is a good spot for a fish trap, that it's a traditional site, is that the, you can see there's shallow water on both sides funneling into, you know, a deep cut in the bottom here. So the fish will follow that contour to the leader of the trap and then swim out and be caught in the in the trap itself from both sides so that's the reason this site traditionally was chosen and continues to be uh, a, a site of interest to commercial fishermen um, inside the harbor well inside the in this trap and i think generally inside the harbor the trap fishery is basically a spring and a fall affair. And this trap in particular has spoke to the fisherman and he is following uh, the practice of the past fishermen who trap fished in this harbor. And the trap goes in in, in May, maybe even in April. And it gener it will it comes out in uh, later June. It's, it's, if it's not out now, it will be out in a week or two, and then it'll go back in in uh, September or maybe October to catch the fall. Yeah, but they're not pulling poles. They're always pulling everything. It's a lot of work. 
Well, I don't think the traps that they use in the harbors are as big as the traps they use in the bay. And I know there have been traps in Northwest Harbor, Northwest Creek, I mean, and uh, there may be, have been traps in that peak. I don't think I've ever seen one there, but there may have been. Well, you have that sort of channel that runs around the east shore right. from that peak. So, yeah. But with the inlet situation, I mean, you know, years ago, that east inlet conditions were probably very different. Yeah. So there might be an argument for the east inlet, or more argument. <laughs> one, one more, right? So I, I, that anyway, that's the situation. That's that's the yeah. trap in two miles. <laughs> this is really the nine line fishing. Well, I think there's a, I think we've got four well, number of that's an issue that's that's come forward that has an issue with this trap. Um, it's, and it's well, we weren't going to talk about that tonight. So I'll leave that alone. I'll bring up one one uh, little piece, little tidbit of um, the ecology and the changing ecology um, in the current state this year and uh, the last two years. We've had a lot more um, year-round seal residents, where um, you know seal populations would arrive here for the winter and disappear again. They're now kind of staying through the summer and. Um, They'll post right at the entry to this nest and just wait for the fish and just, you know, start these fishermen out. So hopefully, um, just going forward, the uh, fishermen will have success and maybe there could be some other uh, harbor applications that come forward with um, the more present, the greater presence of seals on the outdoor spots. Well, the other, the other piece of this is that with these uh, year-round resident seals, we have a really big cost. Uh, Predator that loves to hang around where those seals stay for the summer, and those resident uh, great whites that head <laughs> towards Nantucket and, and further up will be stopping here and have no reason to leave. Eventually, uh, no, this year they're here, and they're always here. The seals, the seals are here. Oh, I know yeah, the seals are. Some of the sharks. Some of the sharks. If you go on the ocean, they're coming with sharks. When you look closer, Mike's talking about sharks coming closer. So the great lakes, absolutely, are in our waters. And, you know, the more that we see these resident seals in the summertime, the more we should be aware that great whites will be around. Mm -hmm. It's like Monterey Bay, well, Cape Cod. It's littered just tons of great whites, and they close down shadow beaches. Right here. My friend lives up there. He said he can walk the beach on any morning and find five great white sharks. Um, yeah, oh no. And usually see one kill something. My whole family lives up there. Um, the beaches get closed down readily. But Monoloy Bay is tons of seals hanging out. And you look around and you see the great whites coming around. We maybe should move on. Yeah, that's good as far as. We need sharks. You need them. Without sharks, the All right, on the old business, we have the East Hampton High School Awards night. Good, this is something, right? We'll skip it okay. for the moment. Um, so we're just going to go on to the high school, and I'm very excited to say that this week, we sent and started an article about the scholarship uh, to students, and one of which was ours. Um, Andrea Rivera Sagde, she was the recipient of our uh, scholarship fund this year. And I'm not going to go into her entire history with you, but to let you know that she's a very hard worker. She came here not speaking any English in, in eighth grade, and she learned to master the English language. She is involved in every possible. Uh, organization to further her her education. 
She's uh, got a lovely family. I took pictures. They're on the um, internet on our website. And she wants to be a neurosurgeon. I have no doubt that she is going to accomplish this. She's already been um, accepted to school and she has a scholarship at Delta, which is going to SUNY in upstate New York. And uh, they, both her science teacher and her counselor, said that she is a unique person in the school and she is well liked and loved. Uh, and which student? Which student? Uh, um, Janice? Genesee. Thank you. Yes, that's in the article. I just posted a nice article under news. Yep. And um, I'm sorry, David, um, I was not, you were at home with babysitting, yeah. right? So next year, and I get the I'm very excited for her. And um, I, I just, it's a wonderful evening. And the, really, they put so much effort into this for her counselor and the school itself. And it's, it's a, it always brings me to tears when I announce who we have done in our It's great. Very, yeah. very emotionally moving for me. So I'm very pleased. Again, her name is Andrea Rivera Sangbe. And uh, so wherever you are, thank, thank you. Okay. And next we have a word quality. Uh, word quality, technical advisory committee. I finally got it. Do it on a roll. I just wanted to let you know that um, there were 10 applications that were submitted to the Water Quality Technical Advisory Committee, which is comprised of the Natural Resources Department, um, various different people within uh, organizations, such as uh, Chris Clapp from um, West Hampton, from in attendance. Uh, John comes to the meetings as well, John Alfred. And um, the four projects that were selected this year and approved, because what we do is we review the applications and then we discuss them and we then submit what we believe on vote to the town to consider as a project. So the four items that were selected this year and voted on by the town um, were the Colleague Krasner House and Study Center in the Springs. And the conventional septic system is going to be replaced with a constructed wetland alternative system that uses plants and microorganisms. It's owned by Stony Brook uh, Foundation. And so this will help with the, the, uh, to treat the effluent and reduce nitrogen into, of course, the waterway, which is at Mount Harbor right there. The next project uh, was to upgrade the conventional municipal septic tank at Main Beach Pavilion to add innovative alternative systems for each of the two comfort stations. Also, Montauk Anglers Club and Marina Amre Montauk, they were awarded uh, funds to replace commercial uh, wastewater treatment system. And concerned citizens of Montauk, they recently received uh, funds for their floating wetlands in Fort Pond, and that was in the uh, stars. They did that, I guess, now two Saturdays ago. It was a pretty innovative and interesting um, idea to help uh, the waterways there. So that's it. But there will be a second round of applications, and that comes up in uh, September. Right, John? September? Um, the announcements in June. Applications are due by July. The decision is for the end of the year. I don't think it's the okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, so always interesting um, projects and learning. Uh, interesting. Come up with the town, but from the All right, on to committee reports. The uh, pages. We just did those. We did the close these out. Oh, no, we know it is. No, this is okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Close out permit B, number one, and press 29 issues 85 Justin Road. I'm sorry, just thinking the same thing. Um, this is a, this is a, typically an annual event where they add sand to cover their revetment. This year, they did not need to, uh, to use sand, um, but they did need to do some beach grass planting, which is done. It looks great. Um, the sand fencing is done as well. And just so everybody understands, these are two contiguous properties, okay? It's one shoreline, and this is the property that is basically just east of our, uh, where we let George the Pond. Um, I would like to make a motion that we close these out. They're, they're, they're done. 
And I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> Sure. sure. The old all in house, to the, I believe it's the old all in house to the west of, uh, to the east of uh, Georgia, two houses down, I believe, the second house down with the tile roof. Mm -hmm. You know what this, that, that was, expo was exposed at least a week ago. When I yeah. Is that do you know what the status of that? I don't. Do I don't know. This, I don't think they are mean. I don't think we have an application. I don't think we have an application, and if we do, they can't do anything with that now anyway. Until after uh, the you know after polar season, actually, it's not even the polar season. That's going to have to wait until the beginning of October. So in all likelihood, <clears throat> that's one of those projects that probably even if they put an application in, it won't be done until. Uh, March, February, March next year. Be no real reason to cover that thing now with the likelihood of the part of it being exposed. Uh, all right. Um, how about votes? Did you all vote on that? I heard a motion yes, in a second. Did. You don't have, okay, thank you. Uh, Susan Yes. Do you want to say everyone vote? I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody was opposed. Um, who is doing an update on the pump out post? I can say. Well, on the pump out, I see the okay, but I don't you know. have information on enough for an update. Um, I don't know. What is the update? My money is I, I noticed this was on the agenda before I came up with the idea to put um, this uh, other piece on. So if there's some <laughs> business with regard to the pump out post that I'm not aware of. Go right okay. ahead. I mean, the update on the pump out boat on the 2022 season. Both boats were launched at Three Mile Harbor in Montauk the week before Memorial Day. Um, they're, they're both working. We're not seeing quite the volume that we saw the last two years. Okay, there isn't the boating activity quite yet, but we're, uh, it's as we get closer to the 4th of July, it's, it's, it's picking up. Um, we had the pump out boat captains met with Tim Treadwell, the new head of Marine Patrol. And uh, it was a very productive, very nice meeting of basically trying to have eyes and ears on the ground uh, with respect to uh, with respect to either violations or just doing a better job. You know, it's a case where these uh, our operators pass boats that may be occupied all summer, day in, day out, that have not taken advantage of pump out or boat service, and the likelihood of somebody holding it all summer is pretty low. So what we're really trying to do with this year is do a little bit more of like a reach out to some of those people that maybe not have used the service in the past, try and get them into it. We did have a, a what was likely an illegal discharge in Montauk over this past weekend. There was a lot of cooperation from the marina that the boat was in. They kind of tracked the individuals down. And uh, I'm looking forward to a uh, to a more smoothly run season. All of our gear is up, up to snuff. Everything's working well. This item number two here, which is Cash purchases or purchases by the captains, which I think we're, we're spent, we spent a little more money than we had the last couple of years. We had to, you know, buy some stuff for the boats, uh, getting them in shape. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing right now is we got a group of captains that are taking pride in these boats. And, you know, we spent over a hundred grand on each one of them. And I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Because you know, last summer we had those, we had those, um, the one brand new boat, and nothing was more demoralizing than going down there at the end of the day, seeing the deck of a boat filthy, the hoses laying all over the stuff all over the place, checking the tank and finding the tank is either full or nearly so. Mm -hmm. uh, we get this, you know, we got we got a good show going on right now. Good people. What does this mean, Jim? But this means the captains have been paying the, uh, the things out of their own pockets. No, I think this well, means no, that. Yes, it does. It does. It does. Yeah, well, the yeah. captains have been laying out some money for, for certain items. Yeah, because what, what they come back 
they came back with the seven hundred dollar reimbursement. The fact that we can't approve anything over five hundred dollars kind of ties our hands. So I was thinking, if we set up a separate budget for that only, that we can, you know, reimburse them sooner. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you know what might actually be. <clears throat> Easier on the captains, easier and easier on the bookkeeping is to give, give our head captain a credit card with a modest limit. We don't have a credit card yet. We don't. No, no. we have a debit card. We have a well, cash at all of the places. Um, um, okay. Um, yeah, but you don't have any, I'll tell you the reason that this became cash purchases or out of pocket purchases uh -huh. here is quite honestly. They shopped some of the materials that they were looking for, and right. they were able to buy it literally 40% less online. Mm. And in this particular case, if you don't have a credit card, you can't buy it. Then we just have to get a credit card. Yeah, we so have it there. Not easy. No? Not easy because of the way we're organized. And okay. But I don't think we could, we could uh, create a more efficient system of reimbursing them so they can get reimbursed yes. very yes. quickly. Could we set up a special account for this? Well, they, they have, have no, they they have no problem just coming in with, with the receipts yeah. and, and we cut them a check. They're perfectly fine with that. It doesn't happen that often either. No. no. And, and so what we really got to do is just raise the limit from 500 or whatever. Just, just, just all, I'm asking, all I'm asking for, I'm asking for is last year we spent a little over $1,000. Okay, I think maybe a twenty percent increase brings us to twelve thirty-two. Bring it to fifteen hundred dollars total for the year. Um, if we get to that point, then we'll come back to the board. Okay. Okay. Fair that right. sounds good. Right. 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 This one for the commission to reimburse all the cabins. Put it sexy. Put the put the form of a motion. I'll make a motion that we raise the limit to fifteen hundred dollars. I'll second. What they like? Wait, who seconded? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Second. Yeah. All right. So, do you remember what they bought out? I'm so sorry. Can you see that? Who? What was first? I can't. I can't hear. I'm sorry. Okay. Good second. Was it the protected views of the bus? So it was protected. Yes. Savannah bought bumpers. She bought um pool noodles for the top. Yeah. Anybody? You know what? You know what? If anybody's got a question. Yes. This is not something we basically no, need to right. enumerate everything no. they bought here. We can send you a copy. Of yeah. And Francis has it in his folder. Yeah, everything, a list of everything is available. Allison, you have that picture? Yeah. And a picture. Yeah. You want to see? Can you put that up? And they sound like responsible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The no, no, no. So now it's the other yeah. is from the next And it's from the other side of the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Philip okay. made the motion. David seconded it. And then there's for the increase. And, okay. and then so do we have to vote on the reimbursement or is that just format? No, that would be a part of this. Okay. So I wanted to just plug in here a piece of uh, my daily interaction with our Montauk captains. Um, you see the photo I put up on the screen. Thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Savannah on the right, and uh, Travis Wallace, I believe, on the left. Uh, Travis is a young, uh, young kid, uh, late teens, uh, some of fishermen in Montauk. And Savannah is uh, just so job. I mean, every day, I see her a couple times a day. She's very, she has such a good presence and energy. And uh, she called me over this day. And I just had to take a picture because she had so much pride in what she did. And I took the picture to share with you guys so you could see, you see those front bumpers. The, the bumpers that we had on the boat were along the rug rail. She used her own money to buy those larger bumpers and, and install them a little bit higher up forward and then also uh, put along the whole top rail of the uh, canopy. Yeah, you know, we'll call it a okay, canopy. canopy. Um, she put a rug rail up above so that you know when you're dealing with these larger boats they have to flare and, and actually that metal is interacting with boats and causing some damage. Also along the back around the uh, the protective aluminum that goes around the outboard motors. She put it there as well. 
she just has so much pride in yeah. the boat and what she's doing and uh and such good energy i think we should be really proud to have her teaching travis and doing what she's doing and she has a, a pretty cool idea and um i wanted to just bring it up here with us to see if anybody would be opposed to her submitting a few possible names for the boat and giving her the uh, honor of naming the boat. How do you feel about that? Sounds good. I like it. With our approval. Yeah. Forms and sweat works. Yeah. That's what I said. A few names and that sounds make sure good. nobody else has she's that name already. She's yeah, I, think I, I think if she wants, if she's done all this for the boat, she takes pride in the boat, she's teaching the other set of captains, that it's a wonderful thing to bestow upon her. and. And give her that extra credit to uh, she named that she has to be here next year. Okay, well, so I think maybe if she submits the names that you know, separate names, she's and... going to submit uh, names for us to choose. Well, <laughs> yeah, so we, we could look at we could take our time to say we don't want this name or that name before giving her the okay, and then maybe she'll use her own. Yeah, I like that idea. Okay, last but not least, I'm looking for new handheld VHF radio, which I, I would like to make a motion we approve. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have $159. Yeah. 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 The question should we um do we only need one? Let's just see how it works. She's asking for just one. coming back for another permit. See how this works. Okay. <laughs> Name of the bill, East End excavated $10,600 for work completed at Lady Point Launch Ramp. East Hampton Business Service, $22.35. Printing for pump out boat. Uh, Seacoast Enterprises Inc., $491.97 for supplies for the pump out boat. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, optimum $167.12. Uh, I think that's going to change next month. Uh, East Hampton Marina, $206 and $143.45 and $219.60 for gas and reimbursement to Savannah was $648 for pump house supplies. I'd like to make a motion to exclude the bills. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Now I have a report of the clerk. Now, I don't the first night of the next uh, round was uh, Sunday night. Tim went out northwest. Did you guys have much going on? One crab. Okay. Oh my God. I just hey, if we're, if we're basically showing Johnson's here. Uh, what? Excuse me. It's a personal. <laughs> okay. We had we had maybe we had maybe about thirty crabs last night. Okay, but on the last time, you know, on the last new type site, I think I had I think I had about five hundred and sixty crabs on one night, and then uh, you know we set out. We, I set out all 100 tags that I had. In one night, I recovered four tags. One night. This was to kill three of the tags. I tagged within a couple days of when I tagged them last year. Oh, and two of the tags were consecutive. And the third tag was off the same car. Oh, so they're family. No, they were, no. and you know what? And, and I where, know, but they're going where together. Where they recover they're going was together. within they 150 feet of where they got tagged in Europe. 
Wow. It was kind of cool. And then I found one that actually Brian Frank, our first year of doing this, where it was a pilot program, one that Brian Frank had uh, back in 2018. Uh, I don't think I know that one. No, I saw you guys had one that came from somewhere else. So. Yeah, yeah, I found the tag two, two, two moons ago, I think. Tim found out it came from Squires uh, Pond in South Africa. We counted 177, so you beat us. I think Tim got 240 one night. And then we had, and then we had, we've had some real problems in Lazy Point with poaching. I mean, significant problems poaching oysters. Poaching claims, the most recently poaching portion crabs. And uh, you know, our, our, our marine control has been pretty disciplined. And I think Tim Treadwell's probably changed his cell number soon. Because <laughs> I think I called him last week at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> oh, um, you know, you know, they stopped the uh, night fishing at the uh, pier at the yeah. end, so they, they, that group moved. Well, this is a totally, totally different operation. Okay, what's going on in there is I've gotten calls from guys that are down there uh, basically casting off the, off the launching rig. They could hear like the sound of shells like falling into toes. You know? And basically what's happening is these people are going down it, and it's a little like fishing off of, off of, uh, off of the uh, hangar dock. No, what they're doing is man, they're going down and collecting horseshoe crabs. We don't have a problem with our oysters with this crab in DC. They, they love to do night stalking on that kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, they, they went down there, there was like 11 people, I think they caught four of them. But, uh, and you know, it was females, correct? Not male. Well, the guys, you know, the bayonet take, they take females, and they take them because they use them for college and yoga. And, uh, and you know what? I'm mean, going to be honest. I see the guys. If I'm there in county, they don't interfere with me. I'll see them over by the yard, orange or whatever. But granted, as soon as they see me head down the road, they do go back over the way you point. They're pretty considerate about the tag portion crabs. If they can, if they happen by chance grab one, they'll they'll report the number. The thing that happened, and this is what kind of said, these guys are like totally up to nothing. I tagged one my last night, tag, okay? Two nights later, I found that horseshoe crib set neatly up on the beach. Then there's a doornail. And I know what happened. They caught it. Oh, it's got a tag. Maybe it's a radio transmitter. Yeah, yeah. And they threw the thing out on the wall. They, yeah, they didn't trace us. They threw it up on the beach. Oh, these guys they caught weren't from, they weren't local. No, no, no. These guys are from the city. The same group that was in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. We come from South Island, Queens. Okay, so we know when they're going to hit. They know them. Uh, no, no. What I've been doing is, you know, Tim's been really cool about saying, hey, if you're dead, you know, I was standing up one o'clock in the morning. I saw five cars. You know, how often are you going to find five cars going down to going down to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, windsurfing area at one thirty in the morning? So do you time that with low tide or high tide? Uh, high tide. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. We got so, the new moon coming up. You know, yeah. 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 Right? yeah. I, I, I <laughs> counted last night. Hey, by the way, if anybody would like to. Tag tomorrow night. I'm not available to tag tomorrow night. It should be a riveting evening down there. You might count 15 crabs. <laughs> uh, that's the 115 a.m. No, that's the over no, that's Thursday night. <laughs> it's huh? Thursday night. And 30. Okay. And 30. <laughs> yeah. well, and 30's not bad. And then tomorrow night is uh now <laughs> one I'm down to social control. It's 11 15 in the Northwest, so it's yeah, but hang on, hang on. I, I got to do something. John, you were doing the 115 Thursday? Tomorrow night and Thursday night. Tomorrow night is 11 15 and Thursday is 105, I think. Um, I was thinking I might. Yeah, it's come 10 11. Actually, night. Susan, yes. you could do tomorrow night. It's 10 11 in that peak. 10 11? 10 11. It's an early evening. Okay. Okay, we count from 10 11. So, anybody place. else? 
We count from Lazy Point all the way down to the first house. Down there by Crest. It's about a thousand feet. Can I? Uh, all right, I gotta see this on a map. Anybody else doing it? Or well, I I've actually got the volunteer. I got Charles who's doing it uh, Thursday. Oh, Charles, the fellow I spoke to. Okay. Yeah. He's doing it Thursday, but who's doing it tomorrow night? You. Just me? Yeah. Who the hell do you think counts the rest of the car? I wasn't afraid that she's gonna be able to talk about it. Everyone's right. I did get a band out there. Well, I have to say, did get a band out there early. When yeah, I did the early with you the first year, I, yeah. I did the, the first year with you when you came with Nora with the camera. Yeah. I was with Brian Frank, and the, it was rocky there. And you know, if you fall, who's going to be there and help me? Oh, there's a dead deer. Almost dead, crashed in the Walmart, so it'll stop on the way. That's a little bit high. I looked at the crowd. Motion to close. Motion to close. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.